So welcome, 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 welcome. Tonight, you're in good company tonight. We have an awesome, awesome guest on tonight who is a university lecturer, exercise-based physio. So we're going to be talking about a few concepts to make you better, make me better, I hope too. And we've been learning and we're going to have some awesome rock and roll stories. And so we're going to be discussing health, happiness and longevity. And it's going to try and condense as much as we can, maybe within an hour. So if you've got any questions, please make sure that you type them in so we can be interactive with Simon. And please like, share, subscribe, all this kind of stuff. And please look Simon up because he is actually teaches this stuff around the world, actually. And we're going to be, let's get him on. So here we go. Welcome, Simon. How are you going, sir? Doug, it's a pleasure and a privilege and an honor to be here with you tonight. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. So maybe first off, I might just zoom in for you here. If you can please tell everybody what you do and where you might do it. So here we go. Uh, I'm an exercise-based physiotherapist. I, I teach posture, movement, breathing, mental control in the form of meditative-like practices, getting athletes into the zone, fixing up sick people who have got musculoskeletal problems, medical conditions, and you know also psychological complaints. Because in the end, I'm looking to get people well on a physical level, their muscles, yeah. bones, joints, a physiological level, their energy levels, the health of their immune system, digestive system, reproductive system, and also their mental uh, facilities. So to be able to have as a default pattern in their brain, a happiness level, which is high, and they can always choose happiness and, you know, be focused, mentally alert, aware, capable and seeking purpose in their life. And that's my wow. main practice, I think. Yeah. And where, where around the world have you been like spreading these kind of messages? I haven't been to Antarctica, but I've been to pretty much every <laughs> other continent. I haven't been to well, South America yet. I, I do a lot of mine there. And pre-COVID, because I know that uh, I remember you were telling me about Tel Aviv. So uh, maybe pre-COVID, you maybe your itinerary. And we got our first hello from Chris here. I'll just put Chris. So hello, Chris. How you going, Chris? So, Chris. yeah, just maybe, I don't know, the last, maybe last year, oh, et cetera. The last year. I think uh, this time last year, I trekked off to India at the start of the year and then I went to uh paris and italy and uh i think thailand and bali and then i went to israel and then i i, I was meant to be actually right now in uh, turkey and china wow. but they got cancelled you know so I, I go all over the place france germany spain I, i'm usually in spain around august and i travel a lot more than i'd like to travel because i've got two kids but i actually <laughs> love everywhere i go but um, but normally I'm travelling to do what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, and and you've also you're based and you teach out of Sydney as well. Primarily, is that correct? We have a, a large yoga school in Sydney because I a lot of the people that I've taught over the years are yoga teachers and yoga students. I also yeah, teach wow. a lot of fitness professionals and things like that. So we have an exercise based physiotherapy practice in Sydney, which we teach a lot of yoga people to and all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's cool. So and uh, before we get into maybe into the thick of it, just to maybe keep it related to rock and roll, as as you can probably see with my studio here, I'll just pan out here. I've got uh, a bit of a guitar collection here. Um, we you have shared with me a rock and roll story. And just before we duck dive on the super content, do um, you want to maybe enlighten everyone about this rock and roll story? Oh, it's, uh, around this time last year, I was leaving one of my uh, courses in south of India, and I had to go give a lecture in northern India. And as I arrived in Rishikesh, I was carrying my guitar because I've, I've been playing guitar for about the last you know, 45 years or so. Not as good <laughs> as you, but I play a little bit. And... Uh, and I was carrying my guitar to the place and I saw an old friend and she said, oh, you've got your guitar. Come and come and jam with us if you like. And I thought, OK, I can jam. She said, we're just going to do a bit of Beatles. And I went, oh, cool, Beatles. I'm into Beatles. And uh, so I started walking with her and I noticed, as India often is, very, very crowded. And we found ourselves walking what seemed like a thousand people. And as we're walking along, you know, she's chatting to me and happily saying how nice it is to jam with me. And I'm going, great, just got off the plane, just... <laughs> 
you know, carrying my guitar. And suddenly she said, come on this way. And we ducked off the path and the rest of the thousand people kept walking straight ahead. And I went into this small room with her, sort of a darkened room. And there was other musicians. And we, uh, you know, started tuning a little bit. And, and she said, OK, let's do Imagine, John Lennon, Imagine. And I went, great. And uh, just as she started sort of to strum, a curtain opened and I found out I was on stage. And I didn't realize that she was about to go on stage and she was asking me to jam on stage. And it was, she'd taken me to the Beatles ashram where the wow. Beatles had come in the 1960s and they have an ashram which was run by the Maharishi Yogish Mahesh Yogi. And, uh, it, you know, it, it had been preserved as their ashram with pictures of the Beatles all over the back. And, and suddenly I'm on stage and there's a thousand people out there listening to us and she had a capo on and you know my music is not fantastic but i had to somehow transcribe in my head from the you know the, the, the version that i knew and she was doing it in the second fret and it took me half a song to actually work out what she was doing in the meantime i'm trying to oh, wow. look like i'm semi intelligently playing eventually the last two minutes i played perfectly wow <laughs> because i think that when you that venue was used uh, by, was it George Harrison, I think. I did look it up, but was that the same place that they record? Um, yeah. Oh, I, I can't remember the name of the record. It's not Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club, is it? It was another one. It was another. I don't remember which one it was, but they did record something there, and it's a brilliant place. It's an absolutely amazing So place. you actually went to I, the I, venue where they re recorded that? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was a brilliant experience. Yeah. I would, to be I would on stage. That. But that was that was quite something. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So, so let's get into this whole concept that you're an, an expert on. So, about health, happiness, and longevity. And I guess being musicians. And right at the end of this talk, I, I want to make it guitar related because I have some, you know, uh, maybe RSI <laughs> issues from shredding all these years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but you know, just point blank. So I've come to see you. How? What would you maybe unfold for people? You know, why would I come and see you to help me uh, unbolt a few layers with health and happiness? Look, the tools that we have to try and make ourselves better are our ability to hold various postures, to move from one position to the next, and to control to a certain extent our breathing, and also to control what our mind chooses. So I call it posture, movement, breathing, and mental control for health, happiness, and longevity. A lot of people talk about fitness, Doug, you know, and fitness is such a very small part of overall health. You know, a lot of people talk about things like, got to get your heart rate up, got to breathe more, you got to stretch and tense your muscles. Actually, this is the least um, enjoyable thing that we can oh, do. It's, it's the least enjoyable thing that people can do mostly. There are a few hardcore people in our society who actually like the axiom, no pain, no gain. And they believe this <laughs> motto of uh, survival of the fittest. You know, survival right. of the fittest was this, is this common thing that we work with in our society, which, which Darwin supposedly brought on. But really, it was a justification for the uh, British Empire to colonize the world and destroy <laughs> traditional cultures. Really, wow. nature doesn't work by survival of the fittest. Nature works by cooperation. And so this idea of survival of the fittest, which has crept into our axioms of life, along with the um, no free lunch Protestant work ethic of, you know, if you don't work hard and suffer, you're not going to get anywhere in life. <laughs> that crept in with the no pain, no gain. Okay, accident. Right. And it's what puts most people off doing things that are good for them. And as a uh, physiotherapist, what I find is if you come to me and you say, Simon, I've got a shoulder problem from playing my guitar. What can you well, do? Well, I was actually going to ask you about that. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I could say to you, Doug, all you've got to do is this, this, and this. And you'll go, oh, wow, my shoulder's better. And I'll go, it's not better. It's temporarily fixed. If you want to fix your shoulder properly, you have to do this exercise three times a day before meals. And uh, I will say that because it sounds like a, you know, Doctor, three hours a day before meals, and after a month, you'll be fine. And then I see someone after a month, and I say to them, "This, you know, how's your shoulder?" And they'll go, um, 
uh, it's still sore. And I'll go, did you do your exercise? And they'll go, oh, no, didn't have time. Didn't have time, any excuse. The thing is, most people don't heal because they're not doing something that they enjoy. If you want to make someone do something that's going to be good for them, it's got to be enjoyable while they're doing it. And mm. this is where most therapists go wrong. It's where most people go wrong in their exercise. Unless it's something you enjoy, you're just not going to do it. There are right. a few hardcore people who actually do something because it's painful, because no pain, no gain, and they actually believe that shit. You know, they, but we have for most people, you've got to actually enjoy it while you're doing it. So I try and give people a prescription of posture, movement, and breathing that they actually find enjoyable physically, physiologically, and mentally. That's that's the trick, I think, at the beginning. And I think that may be relating to how I teach guitar is you need to uh, teach a student something they like to play because if they're not going to play it, if they don't like what they're going to do, they're probably not going to do it. But before I say my next exactly bit here, we, right. we have a couple of people here. We have Jenny from the USA and Alabama, and we also have Luca here from Italy. Man, Italy's been taking it tough lately. So, yeah, welcome, welcome, Luca. Here you go. And so please also, too, let us know where you are listening in from. So... From that about the health, I guess, what about diet and being a musician? Because I know lots of people uh, working on a, a, a nighttime, nighttime routine. And, you know, so as soon as Friday afternoon hits, this is obviously pre-COVID, I would go and do the gig. And obviously being a singer, I wouldn't eat heavily before, before doing a gig. And then after a gig, I would actually probably eat a lot of food I probably shouldn't. And, um, you know start this negative spin of a cycle per se. But uh, what's your take on the importance of what you eat? Diet is really important. And I often thought about what I was teaching to be called, to call it posture, movement, breathing, mental control, and diet for health ah. and flexibility. But the thing is, diet, people think they're able to control. But the word diet is already something which is pretty unpleasant. Die it. You know, when you say die it, already is a negative implication, really, isn't it? Right, so okay. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I eat. I eat the best diet in the world. I eat whatever I like, whenever I like, however much I want. It's wow. everyone's favorite diet. Isn't it? It's not what everyone wants to do. True. It's called freedom. It's called freedom to choose whatever I want, whatever I want and have as much as I like of it. The problem is most people's choice is a very poor choice. Because if you actually ask me what I actually eat, like fruit, salad, vegetables, and that's pretty much it. And they say, how often do you eat? Well, it's now, what, seven o'clock at night, and I haven't had anything but just a, a tea today. I had a cup of tea. Oh. And that's all I've had. I haven't eaten anything and, and often I don't uh, eat or drink till this time of night, but only because it feels fine for me to do it. I'm not hungry. Why would you eat if you're not hungry? And so that's what I do. Now, how can I do that? I do that because of the way I perform posture, movement and breathing throughout the day. So a simple thing is the more you breathe, the hungrier you get. And if you wow. want to actually pick up your appetite, just do a whole lot of deep breathing exercises. And maybe some of the listeners can, can relate to this. Because if you go doing something like freestyle swimming, where you go, that sort of swimming usually leads to people afterwards being very, very hungry. And often they'll think that it's because they've just had a workout. Whereas the same workout, if they're going for a walk or a run, will not make them that hungry. It's just that when you swim, you're doing this forced over breathing exercise. You breathe in, do one or two or three strokes, then breathe out, breathe in, which yeah. is much more breathing than you would do in everyday life. And that leads to a very, very alkaline residue inside the body because you mm. are not retaining carbon dioxide inside you. You're blowing it out. And without uh -huh. carbon dioxide, you're left very, very lacking in carbonic acid. Less acid makes more alkaline. And then with more alkaline in your body, your body feels lethargic. You have less blood to the brain, less energy going to your cells. The nervous system is frail. 
So then your body craves for acidity and the acidity it knows it's going to get quickest will be from food. So the less you breathe, the more carbon dioxide you gather, the less hungry you're going to feel. And that's a big secret with when you're trying to control your diet, because otherwise what happens is if people go for a workout or they just talk a lot or they think that breathing is good for you, that, you know, a lot of breathing is good for you, mm. they just end up getting hungry afterwards and eating the most stodgy, unpleasant foods. People also get very addicted to sugar as well. Many reasons why we eat, in fact, but that's a big one. Yeah, yeah. I like what you said about the breathing there, because I guess being a singer, you'd probably do a lot of breathing <laughs> the, whole, the whole night. Well, it varies from one singer to the next, because what you're doing is you're making long exhalations, but probably a quick, short inhalation. And sometimes on one stanza, you might be singing, you know, for 30 seconds on one exhalation. So some mm. singers actually breathe less and some singers take extra breath and they'll breathe more. If you're not hungry after your practice, after your singing, maybe you're not breathing so much. But someone who's ravenous after a singing session might be over breathing. It depends on the person. Breathing through the nose can often help. And what singing does, which many people don't appreciate, is it causes you to stimulate the production of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is this amazing neurotransmitter that's produced when you hum, when you breathe through the nose, and when you sing. And what nitric oxide does inside the body is it stimulates blood flow, stimulates the immune system. And mm. actually, nitric oxide is exactly what is produced with the drug that was developed by Pfizer, which got them billions of dollars and the drug is called Viagra. So oh, right. when you sing, you get the same effect in your body as what Viagra does. Now that's good to know for people. So <laughs> if, ladies, you're in bed with a man who starts to hum or sing, maybe there's an alternate agenda going on there. Because <laughs> it creates this nitric oxide. But singing is wonderful for that reason because it enhances circulation and circulation gives health. That's awesome. I have a first question here for you. Uh, hi, Simon. Do you like pastizzi? Pastizzi. Chris Vassello, are you from Malta? Because if you're from Malta, then, of course, I have to say pastizzi is something which I was addicted to until I was about uh, 20 years old. And I did actually go back to India to, to, to Malta one time and actually um, eat pastizzi, but I, I soon realized it wasn't something I could do. But I do like hops with bread and oil and tomato but i don't eat that much bread so actually what i do is i skip the bread and i just do oil and uh olive oil tomato and lettuce yes and, he is uh, yes yeah, yes he is. chris it's a pleasure to have you here it's uh you know very very good malta is a wonderful country and it's it's a it's an honor to be here with you and thank you for being here and we have uh some praise here from naz see yeah, i love listening to him he makes so much sense there you go naz is awesome and Right. Oh, net, have much, watch later. And where's this going to try humming? So uh, do, to get do, the effects. You know, if, if I can say one more thing about breathing is that a lot of people in our modern world think it's really good to breathe more. It's really good to get your heart rate up. But really, it's the exact opposite that we know is what fit people do. Fit people run really fast and they hardly breathe at all, and their heart hardly races. If you are running next to someone, and they're hardly breathing, and they're talking to you, really excited, and you're going, shut up, can't you see I'm trying to run here? You know, <laughs> they're fit, and you're not. But if you see someone walking very slowly, going, and, you, and their hearts, boom, 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 you know, that's a very sick, unhealthy people. So do we really want to get our heart rate up? Do you really want to breathe more? Or would it be better? to breathe less, keep your heart rate less while doing more things. That is the secret to health. Wow, that's pretty deep. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> I'm just thinking about so, you know, when you with with meditation etc and I guess this would be um so if I'm use meditation as a model to, for playing. So, you know, when I'm improvising, I guess I would call it flow state for lack of a better way. So, when you get into yes, that yes. state of no thought, you become one with whatever tool. In my case, it'd be an instrument. There isn't, I mean, you have seen me play. That there, there comes a line and it's really hard to explain. Like a racing car driver has like, you know, yes. knife edge yep. reflexes and a, a boxer complete yep. Yep. in the moment. So yep. I'm really not I aware. Describe that. Okay, cool. But uh, my question is, yeah. I'm not really aware of my breathing in that state because 
That's right. I'm making news. So what would you like to say about that yes. state? Okay, so the flow state, which is what uh, some athletes will call being in the zone, is pretty much exactly what the real state of yogic meditation is. The word meditation is misunderstood in modern world. The word yoga is misunderstood as well. They actually mean the same thing. But real meditation is like seeing a Tibetan monk on a hill in the Himalaya, in the Himalayas, on Mount Everest. But what right. they're doing is they're meditating, but what they're actually doing is sitting often naked in the snow. Whereas modern people, they think they're meditating when they're sitting in a cold room with blankets around them getting cold. That's not meditation. That's just wow. sitting in an uncomfortable position, getting bored and getting cold in a cold room. You see, to really <laughs> meditate, you re and, to, and to meditate would be the flow state, would be someone who is doing the five important things. And the five things that give you the flow state, which you enter, and I've seen you enter it, is yeah. number one, what you're doing is sustainable. And I know you can play for hours. Right. You have to be able to do something which you're physically capable of doing for a long time. Because yeah. if you're doing something like push-ups, push-ups are not an exercise that you could do for hours. They're right. going to be feeling like at the end, you've got to stop, you've got to stop. And that feeling of like, I have to stop, subconsciously means I'm going to have to give up. I'm a failure. You don't want that to really enjoy your exercise or whatever activity you're doing to give you perfect health because the flow state gives perfect health. The flow state is meditation. And many studies say that the meditative state will give unbelievable benefits in health. And you get that, Doug, from your playing. It's amazing. So first thing is it must be sustainable. Second thing is it must be engaging, mentally engaging. And that means engaging is you're totally at one with the activity that you're doing, totally connected. I see you, you're one with your guitar and you have no sense of ego because the ego will get in the way. So when you're playing, mm. I mean, you're one of the most humble musicians I've ever met, but you have an incredible ability. Thank you. So to be lacking in ego and also connected with your activity, that is one of the signs they've seen in profound meditators. And it is a thing that's always there in athletes and performers, which are in the flow state. And it is a state when you are not time traveling, you are not past or future. You are here and now totally connected without ego. And that is an important thing. So the first thing is sustainability. Second thing is engagement, as I've described. Third thing is it's a calming activity. It's an activity which makes mm. you feel joyfully calm, not fearful, not stressed, not like you're going to fail. It's calming. So you have very low heart rate very low breath rate. So you probably even when you're playing, like you said, you've forgotten that you're breathing. And if you measured mm. your breath, probably it wouldn't be very much because you're so focused that you don't even forget, you forget to breathe. Then the other one is it must be effortless. And for you, I mean, I saw you play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in about two seconds the other day. <laughs> you you did the whole frigging song in two seconds. And I could, I tried to slow it down on my on my phone to slow what you play, and I just couldn't believe you could play it so fast. You know, even, I've been playing guitar 45 years, I've never seen anything like it. So you have such an ability incredible incredible you know so you. this is it's effortless to you and the, fi the final thing is it's invigorating so i i think that probably you'd be the sort of person who once you start playing you could probably be standing in the snow and play and not even notice the temperature because blood is flowing through you and the most important thing for good health is the flow of good energy and loving information inside your body. And that sounds a little bit hippy dippy, but good energy and loving information physiologically, good energy means good blood flow, good circulation without the heart racing. And loving information through your body is the information that dominates with the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of your autonomic or automatic nervous system that regulates the health of your immune system, digestive system, reproductive system, and subconsciously tells you that you are in a safe place, that you're in a loving place, that you are okay to digest food, you know, you're, that you've safe, protected and trusting. And so these five things will form the meditative state, which is also the flow state that you play in, the athletes in the zone state, and they give perfect health, sustainability, total mental engagement, calming effect, and an effortless feeling. And it's invigorating so much so that it makes blood flow without the heart racing. That's, this that's great. Get. Right. Because it, this sounds really, well, I'll just say it. So 
I think I'm addicted to performing. <laughs> Full stop. Because yeah. since COVID, it just doesn't feel right because there's this chemistry, for lack of a better way of describing it, happens when I play in front of a live audience. And when it, it, it's a to and fro and they react to what I'm doing. Cool. And it just... I mean, as you would know, get doing your Beatles gig, <laughs> playing in front of thousands of people, it would, it, it's a thing. And I think, you know, I don't know. I'm just saying, I think I'm addicted to it because it just doesn't feel right when I don't perform. But, and I want to ask about that, but just to finish off that last point. So the flow state is beneficial to health. So, yes. It doesn't matter what you do, whatever whatever Zen that you might have or follow, yeah. it's important yeah. to, and it massages the soul of sorts, right? Yeah. yeah. Because what's happening in this flow state is you are circulating good energy and loving information through your body. And you're doing it so effectively, Doug, that it sends a message right through your body and that shines out of you. So that you actually go on stage, you are sharing good energy and loving information with your audience. And that's mm. a great message for everyone to share. But you have to share it inside yourself first. Now, when you share good energy and loving information inside your body and you share that with, say, your partner, if you're sharing, you know, when a loving couple get together and they make love, what they're doing is between each other, they're sharing good energy and loving information. And when that happens during sexual union, that causes the release of a whole bunch of really amazing hormones and neurotransmitters, including things like serotonin, do dopamine, anandamide, the bliss molecule, cannabinoids, the things that we get when we, when we uh, feel the good effects of marijuana and things like this. So these are the chemicals that come out when you're dominant in the parasympathetic state. And that's partly why it feels so addictive. But these are addictive chemicals inside you, which are good chemicals. Whereas what happens often to many people who are addicted to a flight or fight response, people who, there are some people who exercise and they tense their muscles, they overstretch, they overbreathe, they make their heart race and they go, I'm really addicted to that. Well, those people are addicted to a different set of chemicals. They're addicted to the chemicals of the flight or fight response. Right. So this close... of the flight or fight response are different. Right. Sorry. I, I'm just unpacking that. So it's not just an experience. The experience is actually a chemical reaction that happens when you're in flow state. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. A good flow state is one where you're getting a really good set of chemicals. Because if people are addicted to the flight or fight response chemicals, what they're addicted to is um, the release of things like adrenaline and cortisol, which are things like coffee and cocaine, if you like. Also, when you're in a flight or fight state, you imagine someone is fighting. When someone hits you in a fight, you are so fearful and you know your life's at threat that your body won't let yourself feel pain. So what it does is it secretes endorphins, endogenous morphine like heroin inside your body. And you don't feel pain till the next day when the chemicals run off, wear off. And also what happens when you're in this fight or fight state is you overbreathe. <laughs> And right. if you're in an overbreathing state, which you're not doing, then you start to reduce blood flow to the brain and give an effect which is like marijuana. Ooh. And so many people who over tense, over stretch, <laughs> over breathe, over uh, overthink and call it good exercise, but actually it's just overdoing and entering a state of fight or fight, will say, I feel amazing after my exercise. I'm on a runner's high. I'm on a pranic high. I'm, I'm, I feel amazing. No, you're just stoned on the body's own marijuana, cocaine, caffeine, and heroin at the same time. Wow. Whereas you, my friend, are on the love drugs. It's a different <laughs> situation. Right. So getting back to what I was saying about being addicted to performing. So mm. uh, from being healthy from this flow state. So no gigs have happened. And so I'm feeling this withdrawal. So I keep saying so. I've got to get a new word. How do I uh, unpack the happiness? So if you can't do what you want to do, is there a quick fix or should I just go back to step one and start getting back in the flow state, which, you know, just asking, is there a alternate pathway? How do you fix someone who is maybe sad and down and out who can't do what they do, i.e. play music? 
well i mean we can always i mean i've i've been teaching online like you're also playing online and you know i think you've been doing quite a bit online lately that's one way yeah. out right but then to play for our own joy to do the exercises for our own joy is also one way out i guess um you know and it's been a really intense time for most people around the world and you know i think you and i are quite lucky in that we've had interactions with people around us but many people are totally left by themselves and mm. they've been told by a very powerful media that there is a lot to be scared of and i think the most important thing to get back into a joy state is to just get rid of fear because fear is the biggest friend of the fight or fight response because sometimes it's called the flight fight and fear response and so fear is the biggest friend of cancer fear is the biggest friend of sickness and fear is the biggest friend of misery as well and once you get rid of fear and not think that we're in a bad place it's mm. just so much easier to enjoy our life i mean look maybe I, I don't want to get into the politics of what's happening with covid 19 around the world but realistically most people if they get this virus don't die most people are not sick i mean even in italy i ring up my friends in italy and china where the biggest spikes were most people were not having a problem they all hear about it on the news but that's different to actually experiencing it i've got friends in bergamo in italy who said they got sick and it was really uncomfortable two friends most said they were not sick but um, friends in in uh, china who said they got sick the world has hyped it up the, the the notoriety of the media to hype up things which sell news mm -hmm. is making everyone fearful and the one thing that will make a big difference is if people get out of the state of fear so turn and off the news the way turn off the news is a good start but when people want to do things to try and get healthy physically don't add to that fear by doing things that mm. physiologically create fear so what physiologically will create fear inside your body is elevated heart rates breathing more any sense of stretching and any sense of tensing so what i try and show people and i can share this with the people at the end i, I can give you some links that people can take and walk away yeah. with you can try yeah. some really simple practices is a way of becoming flexible which is good but without the feeling of stretching a way of becoming strong without the feeling of being tense a way of improving blood flow without having to make your heart rate faster a way of getting energy in your body without having to breathe so much because we do need to have fitness strength and flexibility but the way most people approach it will cause problems including anxiety uh, a sense of dislike it's got to be pleasant if you're going to do things that are healthy for your body it must be pleasant and the only thing that would be a problem with your thing that you're getting in the flow state with is that you're doing something which is a little bit asymmetrical you know because guitar is a little bit like this plus you do insanely things insane things with it <laughs> i've seen what you do it's unbelievable but it's a little bit asymmetrical you know what we want really is i would suggest to you for example and we can talk about it toward the end of the talk some exercises that are a little bit more symmetrical a little bit more balanced which you can enjoy as much as playing guitar you know this would yeah, be helpful well, okay cool yeah because well, okay we'll come back to that at the end about how i get fixed <laughs> that that'll be good yeah so uh more about the happiness so is there any other but i know that i'm just using it as a model about uh, being a musician for myself, but is there any other ways that people can like maybe change their perspective of how they view things? So I guess the first one we talked about is mastering palette. I followed this guy called Jeff Thompson um, through another guy called Wayne Roy, who's awesome. You should look him up. And he had this concept called mastering palette. Hey, Anne-Marie. Hey, going, Anne-Marie. She's awesome. Great singer. And mastering palette. So it's not just food but mastering what you, you input. So obviously the news, but then also the personalities around you, you know, who do you hang with? Like if you hang around negative yes, people, yes. you will probably yes. be negative. And I've been following this yes, guy called, um, uh, so what's good ways of reducing inflammation? Oh, yep, I'll come back to that in one second, Jenny. Uh, 
Yeah, so he said he has this mantra says, Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Because yes. you know, you, you breed what you hang with. So, my question yeah. is, What can someone do? Like, just a couple of tools to be just aware of, you know, how to adjusting the happiness. Because I guess, uh, you know, combating depression, I guess, this is probably a, a big thing for artists who can't do what they love to do. But is there any other tools that you can maybe discuss about that? Well, Sorry, it's very, very happy. great. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. It's okay. It's happiness is pretty much related to love. And happiness, love, and consciousness all go together. And so when we're totally conscious, we're usually in a state which we call passion or love. And when we're in love or passionate about something, generally we're happy. So the trick is to recognize that consciousness, happiness, and love all go together. So it's about being conscious in your day and being sensitive to what you have around you. And as you said, your palate. So your palate really is, as you well truly pointed out, it's not just what you eat. It's everything that comes into you, including the air you breathe, the water you take, the other chemicals and the foods that you don't realize unless you read the labels, but also the people you hang around with, the news you listen to, the music you listen to, the environment you surround yourself with. And what it takes, I think, is people to be conscious and go, they wake up in the morning, they see how they feel, and then everything they interact with throughout the day, how does that change that feeling? And you can make notes if you like. You go, gee, whenever I see that person, afterwards, I don't feel as good. Whenever I turn on the news, afterwards, I don't feel as good. And if you start being conscious, this already becomes a default loving state. Have you ever noticed how when you first fall in love with someone, or you fall in love with, a person is a good example, but it doesn't have to be a person. But often when a boy or a girl meet for the first time, suddenly they care for the first time in ages about how they look or how their house looks, or, you know, gee, I better clean up. Oh my God, she's coming over. He's coming over. I better clean up. And this is because for the first time in ages, we are conscious. So when we're in love, we become more conscious. So if you want to become more conscious, become passionate about what you're doing because you don't need to be in love with a person you can be in love with an activity it could be playing guitar it could be gardening it could be reading it could be anything you've just got to express passion and sometimes passion is hard work but it's only called passion and hard see people confuse uh Arger with passion because passion can be hard work it can be it can be difficult like when a mother loves a baby it's 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 a passionate thing she's doing i mean can you imagine having this thing sucking on you like grabbing i always tell the guys to do this take your nipple gentlemen grab it pull it up and down 30 times while sitting in a funny position twisted to one side do that like 50 times for 45 minutes then change sides and do that eight times a day that's what a mother will do for a child i saw the mother of my kids do this for like two and a half years with one child two and a half years without the next child and somehow they love it it's painful yeah. it's uncomfortable but things you're passionate about you're in love with is partly to do with consciousness find a thing you can consciously be aware of that you enjoy doing it doesn't matter how difficult it is if you enjoy it it's worth doing and it'll give you that state that flow state and i've got a couple of, i really like what analogy that you said there is i guess context because you know what we think is is might be hard in the comparison with um the mother of your children that how, how would you really know unless you've actually been through it you know but i guess exactly uh, I have another concept about uh, training. So this is pretty deep, so I'll just explain it and we'll see what happens. So, so I have this concept because I'm addicted to learning, and as, as we probably had a previous discussion, I'm trying to sort out my thesis for a PhD. Not that that means anything, but I want to make it something very passionate because I know doing something like that's a lot of work, so I want to love it. So talking about putting passion to the side for a second, with learning a motor skill, 
I know that you can have two frames of mind. So I could be focused on the motor skill. Yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And it becomes a discipline. So I'm, I'm just using this word as discipline, meaning conscious hard work. Or if I'd come from a passionate point of view, I try to look at ways, and I guess maybe scientifically, this might be called isometric learning, where you're doing multiple things at the same time. Is, uh, for example, learning a new chord. So when I did my jazz course, I would like learn a really, really hard chord, and then I would like put the hand on, and then I'd watch TV. So subconsciously, my body is doing the kinesthetic movement, and then I would do this like pulsing yes. thing. Right. And so because I would like turn off my conscious mind and focus elsewhere and, you know, commercial break or what, well, back in the days when they used to have commercials, because now on YouTube and all that, there's no commercial. Well, actually, YouTube there is. But um, anyway, you get my point. So I'm just I really like what you were saying before. Like if you start with passion, the hard work becomes a, a non-event. So, yes, yes, exactly. What is that fine line between a discipline and a passion how do you know or maybe i've just answered yes. my own question no what do you have to say about <laughs> it? well it's a really really important difference because you've got to have that that thing that we said allows you to enter the flow state if your discipline is one that you feel engaged in that you feel calm yet invigorated by that you feel connected in the present moment to the activity you're doing, then it's a passion. But if you feel like it's hard work, if you think how long before it's going to end, you know, I like, I mean, I'm hoping my kids will really take upon guitar and they take upon a whole bunch of things, but usually it's like, how, how much more do we have to do? They look at the clock. When you're looking like that, it's a discipline. But when you are practicing, and it was lovely to meet one of my son's friends the other day because he's also playing my guitar. My son can play guitar. You've, you've actually helped him, I think, you know, a lot. But when his friend came over the other day, his friend said he stopped playing PlayStation, to which my son was horrified. Instead, he's playing guitar eight hours a day. And he's going, my, my son said, how can you play guitar eight hours a day? Because it, time is meaningless. When time becomes meaningless, that, that expression of time flies when you're having a good time. And so time is really non-existent. There is no past. There is no future. There is only the instant we call now. And how big is it? Well, mathematically, it's a non-event. So when you can live in that present moment, there is no time. And so right. when you can live in that and practice, that's the real flow state. Then you don't have the anticipation of discipline. Discipline is something you have to finish by a certain time. You know, I've got, oh, it's going to, it's still another 15 minutes. So I guess... Yeah, after asking that question halfway through, I was like, oh, I think I've just answered my own question. But you did, you uh, did, yeah. So I went to some master classes in the States with Mr. Steve Vai. Just amazing. Yes, he's an awesome musician, but just his mindset and actually all the background, how do I say, esoteric stuff, I should say, esoteric ways of thinking and about perfecting this flow state as an artist but also for writing ideas and i guess as you were saying before about you can actually simulate this is it just before you go to sleep is it the delta state it was a theater state that your brain goes yes. into is it there's a, a several deep brainwave patterns you can go into in different stages and we can we can start to reach these in the meditative state that we practice things like you do in right so yeah autopilot pilot functions like yeah yep Therefore, always multitasking. Hey, this this thing that was just said was it? Who was the person who just said that? Uh, Veronica. Veronica. Okay. Okay. So, what Veronica is talking about is a very special place because you said it also, Doug, that we need to enter the ability to rewrite unconscious programs because yeah. a lot of people are unhappy because they have these programs in their you know subconscious saying things like you're not good enough you're never going to succeed you're never going to have happiness you haven't got the happy social gene construct. all these social constructs and the only way you can change them is by entering your subconscious removing the old programs and rewriting new programs and the only way you can rewrite new programs and, and ex exit the old ones is by somehow bridging 
the bridge between conscious and unconscious. There are four main ways to do this. One is by accessing right. your spinal reflexes. Yeah. Spinal which, um, reflexes. Which, spinal reflexes. So wow. I can show you practices which where we can start to access the spinal reflexes and take control over your subconscious flight or fight system. The second way is, and that's depending on how you move, and it's moving in a special way. And I think you do a lot of it the way you practice anyway. The second thing is by controlling the flow of blood through your body without using the heart. The third thing is by uh, accessing the uh, both sides of the brain at the same time. And you're doing that to a certain extent by doing two different activities, one with your left hand, one with your right hand. Other people do, uh, if they do activities, for example, where they're listening for part of the information with one part of their brain, which is usually their left brain, and they're looking with the other part of their brain. So the, the looking um, stuff comes into the right brain, the listening stuff comes into a uh, left brain. So if you have activities that go into both sides of the brain, that can help you enter the, the uh, place where you can start to rewrite unconscious programs. But the fourth way, perhaps the most important, is to access what's called the 12 bridges between conscious and unconscious. And Veronica hit this before, because one of them is blinking. So a lot of people talk about breathing as being the link between the body and the mind or the breathing being the link between conscious and unconscious. It's not the breathing. It's the diaphragm. The diaphragm is something which you can actually use. To, if I say to you, Doug, breathe into your abdomen, you breathe yep. into your abdomen. Anyone can do that. But that ability to use that muscle is something which you can also do without thinking about it because you do it in your most regenerative mode, which is sleep. So the uh -huh. diaphragm is a special place in the body which you can control consciously. Right now you can breathe with your abdomen or when you're asleep, it happens by itself. And that makes it a bridge between conscious and unconscious. And there are 11 other places in the body like that. One of them is the blinking reflex because we can consciously blink or if someone puts your hand in front of your face or something flies in front of you, you blink automatically. Yeah. Subconscious. So. A trick is if you want to start accessing the unconscious, start rewriting unconscious programming, is when you're doing your activity, always check you have access to these 12 bridges. Things like check, can your fingers move? Can your shoulders roll? Is your neck free? Can you chew? Can you make saliva and swallow it? Can you blink? Can you roll your eyes? Can you expand and contract your pelvic floor? Can you breathe into your abdomen? Little things like this are the key to make sure that whatever exercise you're doing allows you to stay in the default state of happiness rather than this uh, state of flight or fight, which really should only come very rarely when there's a real threat. And if there's no real threat, there's no reason for your body to enter a threatened stage, which usually means that you're not going to enjoy it. Mm. So this is a real a real point. And Veronica said it with respect to the blinking. And I think she also mentioned the um, uh, the idea of the computer, the brain being like a computer. Yes. Uh, yeah, your brain is like a computer. You can be your own programmer. Yeah. Because I have uh, yes. followed, uh, this is getting deep now, uh, Bruce Lipton. So I actually uh, went on a course. Amazing. I actually studied with uh, someone called uh, Wayne Roy and did this course about having a go, at pro reprogramming the subconscious, which is, I totally recommend it. Some people love it. Some people. Bruce Lipton, I, I, I highly recommend Bruce Lipton. I mean, I, you know, I, I would like to call him my friend. You know, I've met him on many occasions. We've spoken at conferences together. Actually, at that conference in Rishikesh oh, when I was teaching, he was there as well. You know, Bruce so, Lipton. Wow. Know, yeah, he's an amazing man. And I really respect. I'm also a molecular geneticist, as he was even before me. He's the generation above me. And he um, is an amazing person. And his book, if you haven't read it, anyone is called The Biology of Belief. And essentially, it says we can override our genetics. And that actually what is above the genetics, known as epigenetics, is the environment. And what changes our Genetics, what changes the expression of our genes is not so much the genes themselves, but what regulates the genes is the environment. But what regulates the environment is our mind, because what we perceive Deception. Deception. to be in the environment is more important than the actual environment. Like some people will see a snake and they'll freak out. Other people see a snake and go, oh, it's a beautiful, silky, soft, lovely, non-poisonous thing. So how you interpret the environment, how you think is also how your body will respond to it on a subconscious level. Wow. This is important, really important. So, That's why I say don't be fearful of COVID-19. 
Right. Okay. I understand. Yep. So this is the, the five things that I've been working on is that your behavior is a, a belief of a value value of a perception of a memory. So I'll just say that again. Your oh, behavior is say that again. Yeah. So your behavior is based on a perception of a value of a belief of a memory. For example, wow. so lovely. I love that. So I let's I'll use a musical example. I'm scared. Whoop. I'm scared about pulling the headphones out of my ears. Too late. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, about getting up and maybe playing in front of people or maybe public speaking. You know, my behavior is uh, I'm not going to get up and public speak because my belief of this value that was instilled was my perception of the memory of, let's say, my... I don't know, grade two teacher said, what are you doing up there? You have no idea what you're talking about. Get off the stage right now. Right. So exactly. that's your memory exactly. of the perception. So you value it quite, um, you know, high or low, you know, that you want to do it. And then, uh, yeah, working backwards to your behavior. So, but when you talk to people and for, for so I keep looking down here, but the camera should, should be up there. It's trying to multitask. But, but when you talk to another person about this and they, I say, hey, no, no, I'm definitely not getting up. I'm not getting up. I'm not going to speak at my friend's wedding. No, 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 no. And they keep saying, it's okay. I'll hold your hand. I'll help you. They only can, having another person around can only try and help shift your value to value it. Like it's got to be higher value now. You need to step up and speak at the wedding. But you will never, ever truly master it unless you go back to the memory through whatever process, whether it be a meditation, etc., yes. or whatever. Yes. And look at the like externalize the model Eckhart Tolle wrote an awesome book about this and uh, the power of now and you know externalize externalize the the model and then change your view of it you know there I am so if I'm there's my teacher and there's me as a as a grade two student cool I can see the context she was just trying to maybe make room for the other kid to do the job so you recontextualize so if i change the perception of the memory then i won't have to have that fear if that makes sense but anyway i'm just that's really really deep yeah. but um yeah yeah totally. just putting it out there what's your comments on that i think it's all about our perception it's all about what we believe and the thing is you you can't just treat the brain exactly like a um artificial intelligence it's also a little bit like a tape player. Um, Bruce Lipton was very good. He, he talks about the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. And he talks about the conscious mind is the creative mind, but the unconscious mind is actually much, much larger if it was a processing computer, but it's more like a tape player. It contains the programs. It doesn't write them, it just plays them. So you've actually got to get into the, into the uh, unconscious undo the tape and actually change the program but it's not enough just to let the program run you can't just talk to a tape player and say turn off you have to actually go over and actually switch it re-record it so re-record re it, yeah. it and and that's that's quite a process and to re-record it it seems you have to be pretty much in the flow state so if you can get into the flow state where your body is synchronized as one in the present moment and you engage in that activity in a passionate loving conscious way that's the place you'd start re-recording unconscious programs so if you can do these meditations for you it might be your music for other people it might be a simple movement activity like the ones i can share at the end of this talk you know like which can be as simple as something looking like a simple dance or even yeah. you can do it while you walk or something like that at mm -hmm. these times once you start to feel connected in the present moment then maybe it's the time to make the affirmation because if you just people say oh i want to re-record programs i'm going to affirm i'm going to stand in front of the mirror and say i am okay i'm that doesn't work you have to be in the right frame of mind to do it before you start making the affirmations and the best well, frame, frame to be in would be this meditative flow state because i actually actively meditate and i go every week to a group and etc which is really cool because it's really really mm um if you're ready for it it will open you know knowledge is powerful only if it's applied right you can learn anything you like but if you don't apply it it's mm -hmm. nothing 
but it's um as i would say it's experiential because i could read about it like oh yeah cool you do this and you do that it doesn't mean anything same as like playing live in front of an audience you can talk about it all day long but unless you do it unless you feel the power that happens that you'll never know yes. you'll yes, never, yeah. never know but um yeah. talking about the 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 meditation yeah and actually rewriting this there was another uh book uh wayne dyer do you, you know that's wayne? very good yes yeah, yeah so he, well, he died a couple of years ago it's sad very nice book. yes uh so he had this whole concept that about creating your sacred space so here here i am right now in my sacred space is i surround myself with visual stimulus and sonic stimulus and kinesthetic stimulus that makes me feel you know connected to to whatever you know and i guess in a, in a nutshell it's a temple of sorts and uh what's my question my question is yeah did you ever get to me mr wayne dyer did on your circles doing what not, you do not in person not in okay my, no not personally i really appreciated his work though and so what's your maybe take on sacred space being aware of your environment but like i said before it's um it's your perception of the space around you and you know some of my some of the people i live with some of the people i've been very close to have a very very important need for example to have a really neat space around them they find it really important to have say for example the right clothes to wear and the right smells and other people uh, myself for I'm example are not so much like them yeah because a sacred space is not just the look but it's also the smell the temperature the lighting you know and so all of that makes your sacred space how important are those things oh, for you you know yeah, temperature. so <laughs> so for me things like temperature is a very important part of my sacred space whereas for other people it's all about the look it's some people it's about the neatness some people mm. neatness is not an issue for me if i showed you my desk you'd see it to be what you think is a mess but i know exactly where everything is so it's a very personal thing a, a sacred space but it is important to have and so if someone comes in and tries to disturb my office i'll get very upset they'll think they're coming to fix it or to, but it's something that you create that you can feel comfortable in and whatever you have to do to make that is um is, is up to you but it's important to have a space and to clear a space and to dedicate a space because that's the place where you can then do your ceremony and the thing about meditation and the concept that would be traditionally associated with the meditative state which we in the west we've come to know as the flow state or the um the, the zone is that it's all about repetition yeah and repetition is easiest if it's done in a place which is comfortable so to pick an environment which is comfortable to do your exercise in or your music in or your passionate hobby in is really important and often people will find that they're unable to get into the zone because the environment's not right so by mm. making your environment right that is your sacred space and maybe mm. some people's sacred space is the right park to run in or you know the right beach to swim in or surfing or something like that mm -hmm. so it's yep. it, that's what's going to allow you. a sacred space is part of the ritual and ritual and meditation and the flow state are all inter intertwined because ritual and flow are all a little bit going in automatic i mean i know you know this but for me when i'm playing my guitar at my best sometimes my thinking mind comes in and go wow what are my fingers doing how are they doing that <laughs> because they're doing something which I, in thinking mode, don't even know what they're doing. And then that's when I feel, you know what I mean? Then it comes to a second, oh my God, because if you think too long, you stop doing it. But when the body's really connected, it's doing something which has been the result of many thousands or millions of times of repetition. And repetition is like ceremony. And when we're talking about ceremony, then we're talking about ritual and sacred rites and a sacred space and it's really part of it which is very so, important so to create just, that really helps is that okay to unpack those two words because um yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's all backwards here so uh you said ceremony and ritual so even this this whole point of having a cup of tea yes i didn't actually yes. understand stand this until i i was on tour i think i was playing in 
was it Thailand or because I played in the Hard Rock uh, Cafe in Malaysia. I, I kid you not, I was in the Malaysian All Stars because cl clearly I look Malaysian. So I, I played in uh, Bali, Kuala Lumpur, and Penang. And wow. anyway, my point is I. I Went to all these different tea centers. Actually, I think it was in Japan. I didn't learn this until I went went to a bonsai school in Japan. But anyway, the act of having a cup of tea with your grandmother and sitting down, and I guess what, I got this from the English upbringing, whatever. It, it's not about the tea at all. The, the, the no. tea is just just a tactile. The whole point yes. of the the ceremony was to sit down yes. with an elder that's a generation above and to share the yes. you know share the knowledge. Yes. And I was yes. like. Oh, yes. Wow, and, and then yeah. you know, even having oh, it's tea time because yeah. you know, three uh, or morning tea is means okay, cool, let's regroup, and it should be a social occasion to debrief. Yes. Yeah, but anyway, if that's okay, that's my understanding of of that. But yeah, ritual and ceremony, if that's okay to unpack those. Yeah, well, it's it's to a certain extent when you're playing music or when a musician has a session or a jam it's part of a ceremony we had a wonderful ceremony the other night in front of the fire that was a really wonderful sacred Gig. circle that was Gig. really Gig. nice Gig. to share that with you yeah it was Gig. magical you know really magical so this ritual this ceremony in a sacred space around a fire around a room it's it's really important and when when people uh partake in a in a ceremony there are certain rules in a ceremony, like when you're having tea, everyone knows you're both drinking tea. If two people do the same thing as part of a ceremony, they enter a resonance state. So there was one really yeah. lovely thing that Bruce Lipton said, which, uh, which really resonated with me. He said, when you play a guitar, when you hit your you know, G string on the first fret, it will resonate with the G string on the um, on your th on your th uh, fourth string, right? Your first string G, the deep G resonates with the third, the fourth string G, open, right? If they har they harmonically resonate, so when there is resonance, you get vibrations happening. If the resonance is not there, you don't get the vibrations. So what we want is to resonate with the people around us. So by having the same activities then people start to resonate and so the good thing about a ceremony is everyone knows the rules of the game and so they start automatically doing the things that make them fall into resonance mm. and there's a wonderful mentor of mine also is this chap called rupert sheldrake who talked about morphic resonance and morphic resonance is this idea that if you make a habit of doing something over and over again then you start to resonate with your experience in past times and other places so mm. something which is a real ritual has been done all over the world for millennia that's something which is really easy to slip into the flow state in because you start to resonate in different times and places. And although it doesn't sound modern scientific, it's nevertheless, he's got very good evidence to suggest that this is actually happening. It's a theory of habit. And it really explains why ritual is so important if it's true. And, and he, like I said, he's an amazing guy. He wrote a really uh, amazing book called... Um, I forget the name of the book, but it's about morphogenetic fields, morphogenic fields, and um, and how things affect other things, and how habit starts to create a field around it. He also uh, wrote a really good book recently about the. It's called the Science Delusion, and he talks about the the ten things in science which are assumed but never proven, including the idea that our mind is in our head, that. Uh, <laughs> that mm. uh, energy and matter are, are unconserved and stuff like this amazing guy uh, Rupert Sheldrake but this theory of habit was originated by him and it really makes sense of things like um, the effect of cause uh, the, the th stories of cause and effect karma and uh, samsara these these things which are often talked about uh, Bruce Lipton once said that if you send out good vibrations they're going to come back to you so for example if you have two guitars and i'm trying to tune my guitar off you doug yeah. if you play a g-string my g-string starts to vibrate if i'm in harmony with you but if i but if you stop your g-string from vibrating by touching it 
and then you release it, it will start vibrating again. Why? Because my string is still vibrating and my vibrations come back to help your string vibrate a second time. So when yeah. you send out good vibrations, they can often come back to you mm. because someone else will send the vibrations back. And what mm. Bruce Lipton's words in the last conference in Rishikesh were, he finished with, if you send out good vibes, good vibes are going to come back. But if you send out bad vibes, bad come vibes back. are going to come back. Wow, isn't because that? That's what happens. And really, yeah. And you can really resonate it with this idea of the guitar and how two guitars can make each other sing. And even when the first guitar stops, it will start again by virtue of its own effect on the second guitar coming back. Yeah, I, I really like that. I like that analogy. Yeah, nice idea, huh? yeah. and even... Uh, uh, like a, a piano hitting a note ha has three strings. And so I, I'd met a piano tuner and I was like, how do you tune the strings? And uh, anyway, well, this is when I first getting to understand when you hit a note, the hammer will hit the string, but there's three strings that it's hitting. They're not all the same note. They're actually, really? yeah, they're, they're slightly, you know, sharp ones flat. So it's the, wow. all of them combined effect. Mind, it that makes the pure note and it was like oh wow, wow. so you know i've often wondered about that yeah because it's you know, and all obviously for loudness and blah 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 but uh, i have a couple more things because I'm, I'm aware of your time so sorry we've already gone over an hour but um <laughs> you know i want to come back to uh got a couple of other things but just questions. yeah i'll come to the questions in a second so if you've got a question simon please post a question and we'll quickly go through them shortly but um, I did want to ask, um, well, just, I'll just tell you this analogy and maybe get get your feedback on it. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, Power of Now, I went to one of his uh, presentations. And anyway, he had this concept, my life. And he, and he wrote, used this model of saying, instead of my life, swap it out for car, my car. And this is the dialogue that a lot of people would say in context. What have you done to my car? I can't believe you know, this opportunity has like stuffed up and it, now my car's broken. Oh no, you know, F my car, you know, I can't, can't really do anything with my car. And if you swap it around for life, yes. that's what people do. It, it, they externalize it to a material yes. thing. It's like, I can't believe you've done that to my life. But he was saying yes. that my and life, these two entities, it's a fallacy. It does not exist. It's I am because you don't have a life. You are life. And it, it just like, anyway, this model just blew my mind. It's like I am. So, wow, that you know, you have to be really, really deep here. But anyway, oh, just putting it out there, if you've got a comment on how to maybe, yeah, how, how, put that in context of what you do with your teachings. You know, one of my mottos is something that I learned it's it's a main principle of traditional yoga and it's a main principle really of all traditional paths and that is that happiness is a choice not something that you wait for and to recognize that if you want happiness you just have to find the switch in the brain and choose to flick it some people can't find it but it's always there and to to know that happiness is not something to, that you wait for that it's something that you can choose is one of the most important realizations, which, you know, when people get it, they could probably associate that with something like enlightenment, perhaps, because it's, and because it's not something that stays with you, because sometimes you lose it. But once it stays regularly, it's a really amazing thing to realize that how you feel is actually how you chose. And many people will say a little bit like what you said just then. They'll say, I can't believe you've done this to me. You know, now you've made me feel like this. And you go, how can I make you feel like anything? You chose to feel how you feel. Mm. You know, so to, to recognize that what we feel is how we choose and that the most useful way to feel is happy. You mm. can choose misery if you want. When my dad died, I chose to be miserable for a period of time that seemed appropriate. But he said to me before he passed, he said, don't be miserable. That's not it's going to waste your time. It's just not going to help anyone. So I chose to be miserable for a little bit. Then I choose happiness again because 
what would be the point of being miserable? People who are miserable don't fare as well health-wise to the ones who are happy. Happy people have better jobs. They're more successful. They're more functional. They're more viable. They're more useful members of society. So I don't think it's something that we can have as a privilege to choose misery. I think it's actually our duty to choose happiness as much as possible and make sure that that's something that we regularly choose. And that's something that uh, is a big realization in life. It can be, and, but how do you choose happiness? Well, you try and do something where it's easy to be happy. Mm, the more I, you practice doing activities where it's easy to be happy, the easier it is to choose happiness. And that's what I can help with some links at the end I can give to people as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So if anyone's got any, thank you for saying that. And I guess like about being happy, that's why they have the green room, you know, just next to the stage is where the musicians go in there green and they need to be cool, calm, collected. And uh, actually a little story about uh, working with Rob Thomas over in, in the States is I never understood why they literally had a circle of ushers, you know, like, you know, they, they'd be running out, make way, talent coming through. And it's like, hang on, it's already here. No, just kidding. But no, they would say talent coming through. And it was quite bizarre because I've never seen that before, but they would insulate everyone from the talent because they just want him to be in his happy, happy bubble and just go to the green room and be in his sacred space, get ready and then, you know, put on a killer show. But they were actually his minders were being mindful of his headspace, which was just yes. next level yes. for me to be able to see that. But we'll go straight to, uh, we've got a question here about uh, inflammation, about yep. um, diet from Jenny. I think Jenny had it up here somewhere here. So just to unpack, uh, so uh, from playing guitar and unpacking all the, uh, all these, all the good things you've been talking about. So I've been consuming turmeric, and is it cumin? I think, or herbs and yeah. spices. And I, I never really understood yeah. the power of herbs and spices till later in life. More importantly, uh, this just this year about what they can do to actually reduce inflammation. So I have the question here. So what are good ways of reducing inflammation, reducing SCD and CRP levels? And uh, I don't sure. know. Well, SCD and CRP levels. Okay. Uh, maybe Jenny could actually remind us what the CRP. I think it's to do with this inflammation factor. I think that's what you're talking about. I'm not okay. sure exactly, but certainly if you've got inflammation, um, what happens is the body is not the immune system is not functioning properly, and right. often the immune system doesn't function properly because you're in a dominant state of flight or fight. Uh -huh. So these these two parts of the nervous system, we've got the conscious mind and the unconscious mind and the unconscious mind, or we could call it the autonomic nervous system, has got a couple of major sections. One is called the sympathetic nervous system, which is euphemistically called the flight or fight response. And the other one is called the parasympathetic nervous system, euphemistically called rest, rejuvenation, relaxation, yeah. regeneration mode. Jenny, thank you. Blood indicators. Yes, I thought so. They're the inflammation factors, I think, if you correct me if I'm wrong. But so the, the parasympathetic nervous system is what will be functioning most and be most dominant when you want to heal things, when you want to regenerate cells, when you want to um, digest food. It's the thing that you want as your default functioning mode. The, past, the sympathetic nervous system switches on when you're about to run away from a perceived enemy or fight a perceived enemy. And it doesn't matter whether the enemy is real or not, your body switches into this mode. And when, if, imagine if you really had the proverbial saber-toothed tiger about to jump on you, you'd want to run away really fast. How much of your energy would you want to put into running away? Well, 100%, wouldn't you? Yeah, all of it. So you take out all the energy that normally is running your immune system, your digestive system, reproductive system, and you put it into running away. So when the body perceives that you're in a state of flight or fight, it turns off your immune system, reproductive system, digestive system. You can no longer digest food properly which means that a lot of the foods that you're eat, eating become inappropriately digested and actually become irritants inside your body and toxins because they're not digested properly. Mm. 
And then mm. also you haven't got the energy you require to heal because you haven't got the building blocks for healing. Also, your your immune system, which is normally telling you this bit's sick, this bit has to be removed, this new bit has to be built. You know, that's not going to function either. You haven't got the um, the immune system to remove pathogens, to remove sickness and stuff like this. And you haven't got the reproductive system viable either because the reproductive system is not just, you know, the hormones of how you're going to have new children or how you're going to have good sex. Your reproductive system is important to reproduce more brain cells, to reproduce skin cells, to reproduce your body because your body constantly has to be regenerated. And yeah, if you're right. sick, you need to regenerate and heal yourself. So all of these things will switch off if you're in a state of dom a dominant state of flight or fight. Now, the physiological um, f signs of flight or fight will be things like elevated heart rate, elevated breathing, any sense of stretch or imbalanced posture. I mean, see, sit sitting on chairs is one of the worst things you can possibly do. You know, every joint needs to move in all directions. I'm not suggesting mm. stretching. What you want is to not feel stretch. You want to move comfortably in all directions. Mm. And if you're not moving comfortably in all directions, you get problems. So, for example, many people have problems in their shoulders because they never do this. You right. Know, a lot of people get stuck. I'm always going to pull my shoulders back and down. As much as you pull your shoulders back and down, you need to bring your shoulders forward and up. And one of the best exercises for you, Doug, is to circulate yeah. your shoulder blades like this. And so yeah. what we want is not stretch. We want movement, which is going to take you through a range of motion, which does not feel like stretching. It just feels even movement. But if you feel either always that one part of the body is always in one place, shoulders always down, or hips always flexed in a seated position, this makes the body feel very uncomfortable. And it starts to make you enter a state of subconscious flight or fight. Same mm. with muscle tension. How much muscle tension do people have? People, can, if they press here, there's so much tension. If they press in the back, it feels like bone, but it's actually just tense muscle. Those yeah, muscles right. will block blood flow and they, they help cause inflammation and they also subconsciously turn on a state of flight or fight. But even your exercise, you consciously think it's good for you to breathe more, get your heart rate up, stretch and tense more. That all makes it worse. And on top of that, if you are feeling the emotions of the flight or fight response, mm -hmm. fear, anger, aggression, lack of trust, lack of safety, which could be lack of trust in yourself, all those things will add to what effectively could become inflammation. Yeah, wow. And so what we want to get rid of inflammation is encourage the flow of good energy and loving information through the body, which is a healthy circulation and mm. a dominance of your parasympathetic nervous system. And I can tell you after how we could do that. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, we're just about to that. So I guess, yeah, in, uh, I guess, maybe diet, I think, or well, this is just an adjustment that I've had. I've had a uh, great, I've had actually better results by consuming turmeric because I actually probably eat more turmeric now than I ever have in my whole life. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's really what it's you do with this. Sure, it's good. Uh, okay. yes. yeah. yeah, and yeah, just being mindful of what I shouldn't be eating, I guess, <laughs> cleaning up. And the other conscious, thing is, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah you're being conscious, yeah. And the other thing is actually being uh, more regulated about when and when not to consume uh, food. Yes. That, but anyway, yes. that's just my personal journey. But okay, Simple well, if things, anyone... don't, don't eat unless you're hungry. If you're not hungry, don't eat. Don't eat three meals a day because someone told you to. Eat when you're hungry. And as you get older, eat less. Because, you know, when, you, when you're little, like I tell my son, eat food because you've got to get big and strong. But once you've grown up, how much bigger do you want to get? Your right. biggest problem in life. <laughs> okay, you know? fair enough. Yeah. Well, we have a question. We have a question here: Is uh, can people heal things like cancer through these techniques? So, Veronica, I believe they can. And one of the one of the hints to that is I'm saying move good energy and loving information through the body, and the good energy is increased circulation in the blood, and loving information is a dominance of the parasympathetic nervous system. Veronica, anyone? Have you heard of heart cancer? Yeah. Uh, of heart cancer yes oh, well actually no heart cancer no 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 I haven't. you know i think it happens very 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 rarely if at all but where are the places that get the most cancer they're the big places with the least 
blood flow. The heart has got so much blood flowing through it the whole time, it doesn't have a chance to get cancer. But oh, places well. like the lungs, places like the brain, bone, uterus, colon, testes, all of these places, prostate, big open spaces where no blood flows. So what I'm mm. saying is if you want to prevent cancer, maybe even cure it, what you need is a state where good information, good energy flows through your body in the form of enhanced blood flow. But the state must be the state of parasympathetic dominance, not sympathetic dominance. So parasympathetic dominance is where you've got low heart rate, but blood is still flowing. And you've also got a sense of in intuitively, internally, the dominant emotions are love, peace, happiness, trust, a sense of safety and well-being. Yeah. Fear is the biggest friend of cancer, and love and safety and trust is its biggest enemy. Mm. Certainly, as Stephen just said, it's you know a massage isn't one of the important modalities because that improves blood flow. So there are twelve ways to move blood through the body. Only one of them is the heart, and they're the things that I try and teach and encourage. Wow, wow. And so I guess if there's no more questions here, I guess um, if we can have a bit of a, a demo of something. So I guess if I zoom, if I change this out here, but thank you for all your uh, amazing. I don't actually I've got all these guitars here and I don't have one right here, but um, actually I should probably get a guitar. If you want to tell Maybe someone, guitar. yeah, I'll grab a guitar if you want to tell something about uh, Maybe if you want to share another one, of your things about moving the blood look the most important thing I, like what i've been trying to say is that the most important thing if you want ongoing health happiness and longevity which is going to be something that will help your physical body your muscles and your joints your physiological body which is energy levels and the health of your internal organs of immunity reproduction digestion etc and health of the mind which is the ability to choose happiness more easily and be focused calm clear logical and intuitive in a balanced way then you need to do three things one is you've got to have the aim to move good energy and loving information inside yourself and use that as a model to share with the world. Two is you have to stop doing the things that block good energy and loving information inside your body. And three is you have to encourage the flow of good energy and loving information inside the body. So number one, purpose, move good energy and loving information inside yourself, use it as a model for the rest of the world. Two, stop blocking it. What blocks it is too much tension, too much stretching, too much breathing, too much thinking, too much eating. Then what moves good energy, loving information through the body? Well, I said there are 12 different ways you can move blood through the body, but we can summarize this by saying move actively, move from your core, don't lock your core, breathe naturally, something which people need to have to relearn mostly, the same breath that when they do when they're asleep, but learn how to do it while they're exercising and move in a fluid patterns in three-dimensional space and these are the things i can share with you something like this with simple physical exercises i'll put a link if, if doug will let me and yeah I'll yeah yeah some things you can take away and share yeah please yeah. uh if anyone's got any questions if they can approach you personally yeah like and jump on your can, page can i put a link in the chat do you is there a chat there's a chat thing isn't there i'll put a link yeah, yeah. in the chat maybe like oh yeah yeah lost you, where is it? um where does it say chat but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in. If we do it live, I might lose you. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. All yeah, right, so after, yes, you're going to play something. Okay, yeah. straight after. We'll do that. So my my question is, so here's, here's my guitar. I might have to move this. I might have to stand up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know, a Strat is probably about, I don't know, maybe four kilos, maybe? Maybe a bit. Mm. So. Yes, yes. And, you know, it's balanced of sorts but anyway so my problem is is that i feel uh, uh, ro the rotator cuff like rotating here uh from playing and so from the uh knowledge that i understand is that my relaxed state is here and it, it that's zero tension but this is tension now to put it back and it i think it came from to be honest maybe overuse however about 2008, uh, after our economic boom, all the all the gigs went from, you know, playing three or four nights a week in bands to actually playing duo gigs, right? Because the 
it just shifted. So I found that I was playing a, a fatter guitar and my shoulder was actually under more duress. So straight off the bat with your guru-ness, what are some great exercises for guitar players to, yeah, maybe sort out at a rotator cuff? Because I know I, I, I do have, um, yeah, yeah, just the turmeric thing has been working for me, but obviously I need to do something else. So, yeah. Okay, well, maybe I'll take my jacket off so you can see my arms a bit better, perhaps. I'll just see, uh, zoom in. Yep. Okay. Here we go. So some simple exercises will be for the shoulders, Maybe I'll just lower my camera a little bit so I can see myself, uh, see my shoulders. So a simple one that everyone can do is, and I'll turn sideways so you can see, is lift the shoulders up and down. So the shoulder blades, move the shoulders forward and backward. And then having established back and forth and up and down and making sure that feels okay, now do that in a circle. So you make circles going forward and down backward and up and we do that say 10 times like this you could do it 100 times if it feels right and as you're doing it avoid tension so keep your arms by the side but lengthen your fingers and check the fingers can move so if you're doing it and the fingers are, are free you'll find your body starts to warm up and blood starts to flow at the same time while doing it drop your hips bend the knees slightly and really let the hips drop down like your spine is just going straight as if the hips are a weight hanging off a string which is the spine so with the knees bent you can do that then totally relax your pelvic floor as much as you comfortably can relax your abdomen and check your belly is like a baby's belly just really relax into it like when you're asleep and then maybe move your jaw a bit move your lips a bit blink a few times and maybe move your neck gently and then change direction go backward and up forward and down, backward and down forward and up so now you're going the opposite direction yeah. and doing this a little bit like that and what we're doing is we're doing this is whenever the shoulders lift up the muscles that lift the shoulders up which are above the shoulder will turn off the muscles that pull the shoulders down which are the ones that for many people are over tense in, in some cases and exactly the opposite as you pull the shoulders down the shoulder blade muscles pulling down will turn off the muscles that pull the shoulders up if there's uh. tension behind the shoulder the muscle that pulls the shoulder forward will release the muscle that pulls the shoulder back so you're getting a release of muscles plus as you're doing this you're encouraging blood flow because when the when the shoulder goes forward it pushes the blood behind when the shoulder goes yeah. back it pushes the blood forward when the shoulder goes up it pushes the blood down so notice as you're doing this for a while your body your blood is increasing you're probably feeling a little bit uh, warmer now if you can't do this someone said they can't do that then you have to find other things to move so what you could do perhaps is yeah. your forearm so you take your forearms like this and so this is an elbow movement the elbow movement and I, I need to keep my my arms up high but I would rest by the side of my body and if you bring your arms elbows up then elbows down all the way down elbows straight elbows bent elbows straight elbows bent elbows straight then you do palm down palm up which is a forearm position like this so that movement of palm up palm down you can combine with elbow straight so you go palms up elbows bent palms down elbow straight palms up elbow bent palms down elbows straight and you do it as you're doing it you really relax everything and this although it's very very simple will start to move blood through your elbow and the elbow will start to feed the shoulder and if you could do this at the same time as rolling the shoulders as well it would even better yeah right that's awesome then, thank you for that so you combine it you could do the same thing with your your arms making a little figure eight with your shoulder you could do the same with your wrists at the same time like this and the same with your fingers and then finally you could start doing this which is turning the shoulder in and lengthening the wrist that releases the nerves to your neck and they go right through your shoulder so this is five positions one turn the shoulder in two turn the shoulder out three point the finger up four bend the elbow and five bring the shoulder under your arm and that combination of those five exercises in conjunction with what i've done just then can really yep. help many shoulder problems but the trick is 
you must do only as much as you can without pain. So what I'll do is like, if I give you these links, I've got similar exercises in them and you can look at my site and I'll give you a simple practice for all over body. And when I see you in person next, we'll do some stuff together. But um, but yeah, take some of these things. There's many different things you can do. But the trick is don't do an exercise if it feels bad. Do only what you can of that exercise by bending a bit less, perhaps by moving a bit slower, such that it's present to do. Yeah, wow. Well, well, thank you. Wow. That's awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you very much for that because, yeah, I – I'll take that on board. And I guess that that's the thing, you know, when you're sitting in a, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess because the gigs have uh, sort of <laughs> dried up at the moment, just getting this, you know, sitting a lot of time in the studio, I need to make sure I keep moving and actually doing that. What do they call it? If, I think it's called push and pull when you do the opposite to what you need, if that makes sense. Yeah, I like what you're doing with the shoulder yes, there. Yes. But if anyone else has got any more Last minute questions, maybe say that, but there's a 10 second delay by the time they hear me say that, but you know, rock and roll. But I just want to say thank you because uh, we, we've co covered an enormous amount of content in an hour and a half, which has been amazing. So thank you for your time again. That's amazing. Hopefully we can do it again sometime if that's cool with you. I'd look forward to that. I look forward to the next time I, I play guitar with you because it's really a joy and i look forward to you coming to give my son another lesson because that was the first time i've seen him play his guitar this year so thank you very much for doing that yeah, it's well, just wonderful cool. being able to relate to you and having met you is a really special thing and i i i would love to come and see you live again it'd be wonderful thank awesome you for what you do yeah, thank no you for problem having your program it's my yeah. honor to be here you know you've uh, you've made my night thank you <laughs> yeah thank you well please stay on the line and uh, maybe uh wave wave as i um pull you from the feed but don't hang up just yet I, i'll just zoom in there there we go you can excellent thank you very much everyone it's a, it's a pleasure to have this time with you all and uh, yeah come and write to me if you want and and i can share some more stuff with you but you can take my links from doug but i'll share them with him in a few minutes yeah yeah no problem at all thank you sir all right we'll stay on the line and just want to say thank you very much for everyone who watching and please share and make sure you go to simon's pages and actually get involved and it's up your alley. Get into it. And there's a lot of awesome things that's happening here. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Veronica. Hey, my mum's online. Excellent. Rock and roll. So uh, make some noise, and I'll see you again next time. Oh, we still got comments coming in here. I'm definitely rewatching a few times. Yes, we actually covered a ton of content here. And actually, I should probably be put up this here. Here's my YouTube page, and uh, please subscribe and I, I put my this little bee up here there's a little bee right there because uh i'm a beekeeper and that was to signify that all the little things matter so um all the little things do matter so please make some noise and like and subscribe and see you next time